that will happen um, throughout the rest of the event. So just to give you a, a kind of um, an insight, I'm going to press this a little change, apparently, which it's not. Okay, nothing happening on the tech. <laughs> uh, not at me. What am I pointing it at? Okay, ah, okay, good. So, thank you. So, just to give you an over overview, I'm going to just very briefly introduce by talking a little bit about what I think is an insatiable appetite for evidence. Now, when I started in the late 1980s, I was absolutely an outsider in terms of focusing in on some of the policy issues that are currently now um, of interest to so many people in this room and beyond. And it's interesting how that's happened, but it also tells you quite a lot about uh, what's going on in the wider world, actually. And this idea of evidence-based policymaking, which has um, come to dominate a lot of the thinking in this area, and it's correlate, which is evidence-based research for policymaking. So I'll unpack that a little bit, and what goes with that, the corollary, if you like, which is politics policy and what we mean by evidence. Because as I'll um, come to suggest when I give you some concrete examples, what we consider to be evidence, as in research evidence, is not necessarily the same as what others may consider to be evidence, including policymakers working in areas that we're interested in. I'll then talk a little bit about um, the idea of evidence-based policymaking in the UK context. So it's Global North, and it's very particular to Europe, and it's very particular to the UK. But I hope it will give you an insight, a window, into, uh, certainly from my experience, how this relationship between evidence and policy is in reality. And I'm going to do that by giving you two concrete examples of work that I have been very closely involved in for a long time. Um, firstly, work around refugees and the right to work, which is a very big issue in the UK, but also um, elsewhere. And that work was done from within the Home Office initially, when I worked there in the early 2000s. And then I'll talk about a bit of work that I did from outside the Home Office, um, working with international organisations and local applicants around age disputes in the process of age assessment. Now, I could have talked about lots and lots of other areas of my work around gender, around the, the politics of um, you know, the media, around issues of detention, but I chose these two because I think they provide a very interesting window into this idea about evidence-based policy making, and also because they're over a long period of time. So the right to work, I started working on in 2001, and I'll give you some examples of where we're at now from 2017, and age disputes, I started working on in 2006, um, and again, the recent experiences in Calais have projected this back up on the agenda. So these issues haven't gone away, and I want to really think about why that might be. You're going to find my presentation depressing. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. I work in the UK principally, although it recently left so. Um, but I hope you also find it insightful into what some of these processes are. And what I will do towards the end in order to try to like you know, move us forward in the conversation is to think about where we go from here. Do we play the game or do we change the game? Or do we do a bit of both? And if so, what are the kinds of strategies we might employ to make a difference? Which is what I think most of us in this room are really trying to achieve, albeit in different ways. So let's set the scene by saying a little bit about this insatiable appetite for evidence. Now, the idea of evidence-based policy making is absolutely um, nothing new. Um, it's been around for about 40 years. It's rooted principally in medicine and the hard sciences. But in the last 20 years in particular, it's become very prevalent in more of the social science side, uh, particularly in relation to um, some key policy areas that have you know, uh, been of concern to various governments. So when New Labour came into power in 1997 in the UK, they very quickly published a modernising government white paper in which they talked about the need for better use of evidence and research to improve the prospects of meeting long-term outcomes and goals. So the fundamental idea is that if you have evidence underpinning your policy, you will have better policy and better outcomes for the people that that policy is oriented towards. 
Now, I could say a lot more about that, and I'll come back to it when I unpack the concept a little. The main thing I want to say by way of setting the scene is that this has had huge implications, this shift towards uh, EBPM for the nature of funding in our area. Um, I'm talking about the UK, but I suspect it's the same over most of Europe and, and North America. Increased government funding for research which is perceived as having a potential impact or implication for policy in areas such as crime, but also in areas such as immigration. Big research centres set up specifically to do research to inform policy makers. So Compass, for example, at the University of Oxford, but there are plenty of other examples. And we've seen a massive increase, certainly in the UK, again, I think also elsewhere, in funding that's available for research that's perceived as having a potential to inform policy. I just yesterday submitted a £20 million funding proposal, woohoo, um, and, you know, two of the sections, impact summary, pathways to impact, show how your research will make a difference to the world. Don't tell us you want to go off and do interesting stuff, we want to know what the point is. So this is very much the orientation of funding in our world. And there are significant rewards, indeed, for doing work of that kind. And those rewards take different forms. For example, in the UK, we produce impact case studies as part of the REF Excellence Framework. And they are worth 25% of all the funding that goes to universities. We are talking tens of millions of pounds. So do good impact work. Have a good case study with a good story to tell, you will find yourself getting some money. And I don't know much about the Canadian system, but I do know, for example, that you have the Share Impact Awards. And again, recognition of um, achievements in social scientists, humanities, research, knowledge, mobilization, scholarship. Same idea. Have an impact, we value that impact in terms of uh, what then uh, happens next. And I think um, that is not limited to the academic sector. We have seen international organizations and civil society organizations mobilizing on the back of that and thinking, OK, if government's serious about evidence, let's produce some of our own. Let's commission some. Let's have budgets for research. So a lot of us are engaged in research with the non-academic funders who provide us with money to do research on topics that are of interest to them. I've done work for Save the Children, for example, around detention. Um, I've been commissioned by UNHCR to do work around gender and persecution. So these are the kinds of things that we do. And we as academics often feel that if we work directly with those people, our chances of having an impact are greatly increased, and therefore we're happy to oblige. Now, just before I move on to sort of the critique, if you like, um, we're seeing this right now as we speak in terms of the global compact processes. You'll note there's two parallel global compact processes around refugees and migration. Don't start me. I have a lot to say on this. Um, but the point I want to make here is if you unpack the drafts as they're evolving, this idea of evidence-based policy making is running through and through what is being produced. So for example, the global compact on refugees that's being led by UNHCR Section 6 talks about data and evidence, talks about evidence-based measures, and talks about the importance of generating and disseminating evidence in order to change how things are for refugees. Now, it's interesting that the second draft uh, has had various tweaks made to it, but the biggest tweak is that it's now an extra four lengthy paragraphs relating to this topic in what is actually quite a short and cursory document on most other elements of refugee protection. So data is there front and central. The Global Compact for Migration led by IOM is very similar. Now they start with us this idea of a common understanding, and I'm going to come back to this because I think it's at the heart, in a way, of the problem. Um, they talk about the unprecedented review of evidence of data, um, the need for this data to shape our common understanding of the complex phenomenon of migration that we must gather and share more and better data, that then our citizens should access to act, uh, objective, clear information about the benefits of migration. So more evidence, better data, all will be well in the world. And that is then reflected in their actionable commitments, number one objective of the Global Compact uh, for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, build a robust global evidence base. So. 
I don't think we can dispute that evidence is seen as the solution to the problem that currently faces so many of the refugee groups and communities with whom we closely work. Um, and it's going to translate into real action. So these are, I mean, the, the global campaign on migration um, is really, really lengthy and detailed about what should then happen. We should basically have all of these things happening. There are plans for all of these things, more data, capacity building, blah, blah, blah. So basically, you're all OK in this room. You've got a job for life, because if this is the direction of policy making in the refugee and migration world, we are all going to be very busy people producing stuff for policy makers to then take into account. Great. That's fantastic. If that were the way in which this worked, but of course, it absolutely is not. Because we know from doing work in this area, probably all of us in this room, that actually this idea of a, a policy evidence gap, that all is needed is more evidence and strategies to bridge the gap, is not actually the heart of what's going on here. So this idea that you know, if you have more evidence, you have better policies, you have better outcomes, presupposes a jointly understood, mutually advantageous relationship between researchers on the one hand and policy makers working on the other, and all of us have a common understanding. We have a common goal. We all know where we want to be. And in that context, actually, all we have to do is produce good evidence, objective, neutral, you know, solid, robust research evidence, and away we go. And one of the consequences of that hypothesis, if you like, is that all of us in this room, myself included, and I am very guilty of this in my own uh, work, are encouraged to make our research more user-friendly. <coughs> you know, it's great, you produce really good research, but I don't understand it, it's too long, it's too complicated, it uses too many big words. If you could only, you know, do things with it to make it more user-friendly, then the policy makers would be on it like a shot, right? So, basically, you need to build the interest of the policy makers into your research design, speak their language, talk back to them the language they talk to you in, you need to make your writing understandable and relevant. You need to focus on the things that matter to policymakers, whatever they might be. You need to think very carefully about where you publish your findings. Who, after all, has access to or reads a journal? What's the point in publishing in journals? And you need to develop and nurture your personal relationship with, person with policy context. Don't let them go. If you get that business card, work it. And more than anything else, you need to hold events to engage policymakers, and you need to get yourself on Twitter. If you do all of these things, your research will have an impact, you will change the world, the very thing that you're interested in will suddenly be known to policymakers, and away we go. There are versions of this which are not discouraging, right? But I'm also going to say to you in this presentation that if we start as that being our starting point, we're in serious trouble. Because most policy areas have multiple, often competing political interests, and those interests are not just about what we focus in on, but the values of the people that are making the policy. And asylum and migration is not just not an exception, it's probably the clearest example right now of where that's the case. So if there is any issue, any policy issue, that illustrates the differing values and differing political interests, it is the area in which we work. And this has huge implications for everything that we do as researchers, for the questions that we ask, including the way that we frame our research questions ourselves, for the kinds of information that are viewed as being of relevance, and for decisions about what counts in terms of evidence. And we know from doing work in this area that what policymakers are interested in is often not what we're interested in, it's about their pragmatic needs, and those needs can change very quickly. You know, a minister says, I need something on X. Windrush. Nobody was much interested in Windrush until a month ago. <laughs> Suddenly, you've got researchers scurrying around collecting data on Windrush. It's not like it's new, it's just that the political interest or focus has shifted. We also know that the use of research by policymakers is rarely direct. Unlike the funders, we know that just because you produce a paper on this and tweet about it, policymakers don't turn around and go, aha, if only I'd known, let's just change that policy. And that's largely because policymakers 
don't make policy. I mean, they implement policy, they write it, but it's politicians that make policy, and politicians who decide what the policy is ultimately going to look like. So not only is it not direct, that relationship, it's also me mediated by others, by think tanks, by lobbyists, by advocates, by the people we try to get on side with, and of course the media, which not only shapes what people hear, but also creates a broader context within which that material then drops. So from my perspective, it's not enough just to do our stuff better or to communicate it more effectively. We really need to understand and unpack the practices of knowledge production and policy making. And once we have a better sense of this, then we can be clearer about what the potential strategic points of intervention might be and therefore be more effective in what we do. One of the problems with, and I'm going to go on to some examples in a minute because that's enough of the, the sort of theory, if you like, but one of the problems about policy is that people talk about policy with not really saying what they mean. Um, it's clear that policy is not just about policy and policy makers, it's about policy cycles and various stages in the policy making process, overlapping stages. Lots of feedback loops, this doesn't really illustrate it uh, clearly enough. Um, and it's about multiple actors. And they come in at various stages to shape and inform uh, what, what it is that actually happens in practice. <coughs> now the points of intervention typically that we are interested in are around evaluation. So that policy is rubbish, it doesn't work, here's why. Um, or, sorry, just to go back one, or around trying to influence policy formulation. So we try to, in a way, come in on the back of a policy that we know is going to happen and try and make it better or say why it should be done differently. What I think we're less good at doing is the number one box, which is agenda setting. And that's what I really want to focus in on in terms of where I think we need to be orienting, orientating our interventions. Okay, so you already, you already have sensed I'm a bit frustrated about this world that we inhabit, but let me, let me put the gear up even further and give you some examples of my frustration. <laughs> and this frustration comes from really believing that when I finished my PhD, um, I've been working very closely with the Refugee Women's Legal Group, we've been doing lots of, you know, really good and quite effective in some ways advocacy work around gender <laughs> guidelines for refugee protection. I, I got the opportunity to go and work at the Home Office at a time when the Blair government was very committed to this idea of evidence-based policy making. And I was just like, this is a dream job. I'm going to go in that home office and I'm going to sort stuff. Uh-uh. Didn't work out quite in that way because not only was I a very small player in a very big machine, which is of course the home office, um, but the politics of asylum policy in the UK are not great now, but they never have been. And they certainly weren't in the early 2000s. So we just had the publication of Secure Borders Safe Haven, this is 2001, this is like the mark of the new government, how it's going to deal with migration. And essentially what that did was two things. One is it explicitly set up a commitment to evidence-based policy making within it, which is great. Um, but the other is that it very clearly set up a differentiation between good migrants on the one hand, those coming to contribute economically, and bad migrants, didn't say that, but that was the subtext and very clear, uh, irregular migrants or, or migrants illegal, as they were called, um, and asylum seekers, taking advantage of our hospitality, working our system. Why do you think we've got 100,000 arriving in the last few years? Because they have exploited our generosity as a nation and we need to clamp down on all of that. So it was clear, even at that stage, that even though the language of this, in a way, sounds as if it was positive in terms of the approach to using evidence, even at this early stage, the definition of evidence was really not necessarily a reference to robust, systematic, academic research and analysis. Now, there is a paragraph, I'm not going to give it you here, but it is in that white paper about accommodation centres. We will go out and do research on accommodation centres and we'll have a new policy for accommodation centres. I did that research. You won't ever have seen it. It was never published. It suggested that accommodation centres weren't a good idea. Um, I don't need to say any more. I probably shouldn't. Um, but one example that is in there that also illustrates the point is about visa regimes. 
So, I don't know if you can read it, but it says, visa regimes represent an effective tool in the control of those seeking to come to the UK. A visa regime will be imp normally be imposed where there is evidence of the systematic abuse of our immigration controls. Now, the kind of evidence that's being spoken about there is not research evidence, it's management information, which basically means evidence that's collected by immigration officers and others in the process of managing those borders. So already you can see that there's a sort of slippage between how we use evidence in different contexts and the people that are actually uh, referring to those things. Anyway, I have remained positive. I'm still going to change the world. Just let me at it. I will sort this out, no worries. And the first thing that, one of the first studies that I was involved in was around, well, it actually wasn't a study about refugees and the right to work, but it became tied up in the issue. So this study, understanding the, asylum, uh, understanding the decision making of asylum seekers, was the first study that I managed when I was at the Home Office, carried out by Vaughan Robinson, who was then at uh, Swansea University, which I subsequently uh, joined later on. Um, I won't say much about the research, because it's quite descriptive, but when it very well cited, you may even be familiar with it. Um, but it was commissioned, it wasn't commissioned from Wing Government, it was funded by the Home Office from the Immigration Research and Statistics Service where I worked, and that's why I uh, managed it. And what they did, essentially, the authors, and it's again not rocket science, was that they interviewed uh, 65 asylum seekers in 30, uh, 63 households, primarily from Sri Lanka, Iran, Somalia, and Romania, uh, which was at that time the biggest groups that were arriving in the UK and claiming asylum. And they concluded, I mean, they concluded lots of different things, but one of the things they concluded, in the vast majority of cases, employment did not play a dominant role in the decision to undertake migration from the country of origin or the choice of the UK as a destination. There was little evidence that interviewees had targeted the UK because it was thought to offer better employment opportunities. Okay. That research was eventually published. It took me six <coughs> months to persuade David Blunkett that it should be published. He spent a lot of time via his special advisor trying to convince me that 65 asylum seekers was not a robust representative sample and that therefore it should not be published. And I spent a lot of time trying to persuade him that qualitative data didn't need to be representative. Anyway, after multiple discussions, it did come out and in the same month, the government removed the right to work for asylum seekers in the UK. So this is a Home Office study, a Home Office Research Study 243, and this was the consequence. It wasn't the consequence of the research, it was what the government was going to do anyway. It's just that, annoyingly, we produced a study published at the same time that said it didn't make any difference. Now, I didn't give up on this topic, because this topic actually, not just the issue of work, but this kind of set of assumptions about why refugees make choices about particular countries or particular destinations, I think this is fundamental to what's underpinning a lot of the research, uh, the policy uh, approach in general. And when I left the Home Office with a short sojourn at the Institute of Public Policy Research, I was commissioned to do a piece of work with the Refugee Council, again, looking at this issue of choice and chance, and whether or not people were coming to the UK because, as people suspected, it was a rose bed of fabulous welfare opportunities and employment, and, and, and. Um, our project involved even smaller numbers of people, but nonetheless was very in-depth. It took 43 um, asylum seekers from different countries, not surprisingly, this was uh, nearly 10 years later. Um, and we also concluded uh, again, not surprisingly to those of us that work in this area, that permission to work had not had any impact on the decision-making of asylum seekers. Although the right to work was removed nearly a decade previously, we said, very few were aware of this policy had been introduced until after they arrived in the UK. So in fact, how could it therefore have influenced their decision-making? And this uh, short quote from an Algerian man we spoke to illustrates that. Before I came, I didn't know that asylum seekers are not allowed to work. And I think this rule is not good for the British economy. I heard people are waiting for ages and having everything paid for them. This is ridiculous. <laughs> I don't need to comment, but he's right, of course. Um, people, other people have looked at this issue of right to work subsequently. It's an ongoing issue. In fact, um, Lucy Maiden and her colleagues at Sheffield have published quite a lot on this. 
And they have recently, or 2016, published a review that says none of the 30 studies we looked at found a long-term correlation between labor market access and the choice of destination. Quite the contrary, the most up-to-date work concludes that access to work has had little, if any, effect on variation in asylum applications. So, there you have the evidence. I mean, we can question whether it's in-depth enough, whether it's robust enough, and all those other things. But what evidence there is um, uh, clearly states that there is no evidence that the right to work is a pull factor for refugees. When we published our work in 2010 with the Refugee Council, Neil Gerrard asked the then Labour Minister, Bill Woolis, um, to explain you know, um, whether they thought the permission to work was a pull factor for asylum, and if so, what the evidence was that they based this on, this assumption. Because once the right to work had been removed, um, people just simply don't have an opportunity to work even if their case takes a long time. Um, Mr. Wallace said various things, but the bit that I've highlighted in blue is the bit that's most relevant. Giving asylum seekers or failed asylum seekers permission to work would be likely to encourage asylum applications from those without a well-founded fear of persecution at the cost of others. Asylum intake has dropped significantly since the policy change in 2002. So not only are they ignoring the evidence that says to the contrary, they then do this wonderful nonsense of conflating correlation and causality. So what they do, they take all the downturns in application rates, and you can't see them there, but the things they attach to them as being the causes of the falls are everything to do with border controls, visa regimes for Zimbabwe, juxtaposed controls in France, airline liaison officers, changes to the appeal system. And they put those in at various points to say, ta-da, look, our policies make a difference. And this is kind of the thinking that goes on. But of course, guess what? All sorts of other stuff was happening in the world at the same time, including the end of the crisis in former Yugoslavia, which made quite a difference to the number of people that were arriving in the UK at that time. So this is really about illustrating the nonsense, in my view, of evidence-based policymaking. Even if you work from within government, even if there's plenty of evidence, if the government wants something to happen for political reasons, then it will be so. This is the latest guidance on the right to work, and it says here specifically that the policy intention is in part to protect the British citizens, fine, to ensure a clear distinction between economic migration and asylum that discourages those who do not need protection from claiming asylum. So it's there. Nearly 20 years after our study, or 15 years after our study, there is evidence the only thing there's evidence of is that the government doesn't take notice of evidence, essentially. Um, and in fact, despite all of the evidence from the OECD and otherwise about the importance of labour market access for refugee integration, um, they choose to do effectively exactly the opposite. Now, my next case study is slightly quicker and slightly more, um, well, what can I say? It's, it's a kind of another example of the way in which Research, even if you do it from outside of government and form alliances with international organizations, etc., um, still is not just ignored, but the, the, the agenda of the political debate sort of almost carries on in parallel to what it is that you do. So this, uh, this piece of work that I did for the Immigration Law Practitioners Association on age disputes, it was published in 2000 and, um, 2007 at a time when um, there was a lot of concern about the changes that were being proposed to the system for supporting UAS, which I hate, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, children seeking asylum. Um, and we did this work, we had lots and lots and lots of um, collaboration and support from organisations, social workers, uh, legal advocates. You'll see that the uh, foreword was written by uh, uh, Professor Sir Alan Green, who was at that point Children's Commissioner for England, we had all the people on site, the work was very robust, you know, it, it was very clear that the problem, what the problem was, and that, for example, de dental x-rays were not the solution uh, to the problem. But the reason I wanted to pull out this example is that what we saw as being the problem was not the same as what the Home Office saw as being the problem. So the problem on our point of view, as we defined it, was that the consequences of um, um, increased age disputes, which at that point were running to about 45% of 
of all children that were arriving, basically meant that children were less able to access protection and they were less able to be safe because they were being put in bed and breakfast accommodation with adults. They were being detained with adults as adults um, because the policy was not to detain separated children. And so basically kids were being defined as adults so they could be detained. So we were very clear about what the problem was, what the risks were, as were the social workers we were working with. The Home Office uh -uh, thought it was a very different problem was adults pretending to be kids. And so it framed this in terms of you know, the risks to children in children's home and other protective accommodation who would be abused by these adults, rather than the risks to children who would not be under any kind of supervision but bouncing about in an adult system or in detention. So the problem in this case was, um, again, it didn't relate to the evidence, but it related to what people understood the evidence to be pointing towards in terms of the problem. No one disputed our evidence. No one said there wasn't enough interviews, there wasn't enough detail, there wasn't. That wasn't the challenge in this case. The challenge in this case was the problem is adults pertaining to children, we need to x ray them. Now, there was lots and lots of pushback, pushback internationally. Um, you know, this went basically to the European level, and nothing much happened. Dental x rays kind of continued on an ad hoc basis, but the whole thing basically stayed the same, which was not good. But, you know, you take things staying the same the moment because when things change, they normally get worse. So, okay, fine, we will work with this and we'll use the guidance. And then, and then, uh, sorry, and then this happened, which was that there was a campaign in the UK to try and get 3,000 children stuck in Calais in the jungle to come to the UK to be reunited in most cases with family members already in the UK. So they had a legal right to be in the UK and they were living in the jungle for, I hate that expression, they were living in that camp for several years. And of course, you know, incredibly vulnerable. When they arrived, there was a media circus. And front of the queue, the Daily Mail, our favourite, not favourite newspaper, for making sure that refugee issues are as misunderstood as possible. Um, so the headline, is lots of headlines, but this particular one was, in the UK, child refugees of Calais. The Daily Mail doesn't normally do nuance. It's not normally one for using inverted commas, unless it intends to suggest by that that perhaps they may not be children. So this picture I'm showing you is actually from the Huff Post. Those faces of those children were not pixelated. They were as they were. They took pictures of those kids as they arrived. Those kids had been assessed as kids by social workers taken over to the, to the jungle in Calais. So they were entirely legitimate on every criteria. Now, Labour, Tories were in power at this point, of course. Labour's response, yay, come on, Labour, with your opposition. Give child migrants age tests, said Straw. So we're right back to where we were in 2007. The irony of this particular piece is that to the, your right, spot the difference. Supermodel Cindy and her daughter, who's only 15, and she looks like an adult. So, you know, deep breath, really, in terms of the irony. Um, but the Daily Mail then went one step worse. It decided that, okay, if the Home Office isn't going to do uh, tests of children, like proper tests, dental tests, you know, the ones that can tell people's age like a stick of rock with their date of birth running through them, if the Home Office isn't going to do that, we'll do our own version. So we'll take a Google online program called How Old Do I Look? And we'll run those faces through it. And then we'll print them in our newspapers. Yeah, sharp intake of breath. I mean, there's so many things wrong with this. Um, but it's also very frustrating when there's so much evidence, not just about the process of age assessment and the problems of technology, but also about the risks and vulnerabilities of these children and the evidence that we have of, well, you know, it kind of still leaves me slightly speechless. So before I go on to my... Up, you know, my upbeat ending, which I'm sure you're, you're wondering how I'm going to get there at this point in time. I was in my hotel room last night and I, um, let's see, I thought I'd have a go. So, okay, this is my, uh, this is my work picture. I'm happy with this. It's more or less, I can live with 49. 
It's fine. Not, obviously an okay day. I thought, I'll try, I'll try. Try a picture of me at the, at the Christmas holidays. <laughs> oh dear. Something happened in that year. Oh, I don't like the cold. My husband will be very happy. <laughs> My daughter, she's 23. So actually, that's not far off, which of course proves that the system works. Just cut those two out. <laughs> I was, um, obviously I had nothing better to do. This is my Facebook picture. This is 77. I thought it was a good photo. I looked happy, I was relaxed. Anyway, clearly not so good. My dad, who is in his 70s. <laughs> my daughter has progressed to 76. So my point is that the evidence that the Daily Mail thinks is worthy of policy change is not necessarily the evidence that we all in this room believe is sufficiently robust to warrant uh, a change of policy direction. So where do we go from here? Where do I go from here in terms of this presentation? Difficult to know. Um, but I'm going to sort of finish by giving you some reflections of what I think this all means. I'm first of all going to reflect on this idea about whether we play the game or we change the game. And I suppose cards on the table, I don't think it's an either or, I think it's both. But first of all, we need to know what game we're playing. And that's where the politics of this comes in. So I think the problem with this emphasis on, you know, just make your research more accessible, just talk to the policymakers about what they want to hear about, change your language, it belies this very complex and difficult relationship between academics and policymakers whose whole modus operandi is quite different and who have widely divergent motivations, objective measures of success. All of those things are not the same. It's an inherently political process, and I hope these two case studies that I've showed you have illustrated that in these cases, evidence has just not been able to make any headway because of the politics of the media, the politics of you know, party politics, as well as uh, the politics writ large globally of how refugees are perceived. Um, and we have very different ideas about what constitutes evidence, particularly where this evidence supports conflicting or contradictory claims. So, you know, the common accusation to a children's organization working on children is, you're only interested in children. You know, so the, the kind of broader context uh, provides the, the backdrop for wh within which that data will then be dismissed, albeit that that data in of itself may be critically important. There isn't a linear or a straightforward uh, relationship between research, evidence and policy outcomes. In fact, there's rarely an in, uh, immediate or direct effect. But if you all went out there and wrote stuff tomorrow saying that the border should be closed, you would be having a direct effect very quickly because that is what people want to hear. So research is much more likely to support uh, impact if the findings support existing ideologies and discourses and don't challenge those dominant narrative. And I think the challenge for us then is how do we not just produce more and better evidence in ways that are accessible in all senses of the word, but how do we better understand this relationship between knowledge construction and use? And for me, that re requires us to very explicitly reflect on our own role in producing and reproducing certain ways of understanding the world. Now, this takes us into a whole discussion, potentially, that we don't have time for, about the production of knowledge. There is a lot written on this, um, and a lot that I could say. But what we know is that knowledge is not objective truth out there, but rather is constructed and regardless of the producer, it represents and reproduces certain systems of power, of privilege, and it has material consequence. And we are knowledge makers in this room, okay? So we have power and we have privilege. And how we wield it, use it, engage with it, is making a difference whether we think it is or not. So there are limitations and dangers of engagement, in, in my view, of working with policymakers or politicians, more precisely, on their own terms. Because those terms right now are not terms that, frankly, I want to be complicit in. 
And I think that in order to make a difference, we have to have a much more critical engagement with policy categories and priorities. Because those policy categories and priorities very often misrepresent or artificially constrain our understanding of what's going on. Do we want to play that game? Do we want to, you know, give people the material that confirms what they believe uh, to be right? And I think that we also need to engage with the politics of bounding in all of this. These categories don't just exist, they're set up. They're set up to control and manage, and they have consequences. And the article that I published last year with um, um, my colleague Dimitris Kleperis was really about that in the context of our MedMig research on the European refugee crisis. So categories don't they're not just containers, they don't just hold things, they're a way of organising the world. And if we just use the categories that policymakers are interested in, then in a way we just are complicit with that way of seeing the world. And it's an old article now, but if you haven't read it, go and read Oliver Bakewell, who reminds us of the importance of policy-relevant research. I'll be honest with you, when I first read Oliver's article, I not long left the Home Office and IPPR, I was working at Swansea, I think, it really annoyed me. <laughs> it really annoyed me because I'd spent 10 years trying to do the policy research. And I kind of like threw it to one side and went, nah, Oliver, you don't understand. You haven't worked in the Home Office. And then I reflected on what he was saying and I lived this a little bit more and I absolutely now are on his page. You know, we do have to construct our knowledge in ways that are robust and meaningful, but we also have to do things that people don't want to hear and we have to challenge what they think already exists. Which I suppose brings me to my final slide, which is strategies for making a difference. I think the bottom line is, and we'll hear a lot about it, I suspect, over the next few days, is we live in a very diverse, stratified, complex world. And we do not want to back away from that in our own representation of that world. So many people say to me, when we talk about the MedMig research, yeah, 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 but you just keep on talking about complexity and how complicated everything is and diversity and oh, we as policymakers, that's not helpful. And I'm like, I know, but you're going to have to come to terms with this because this is the world. So we can either simplify it down for them, dumb it down, or we can say it how it is. And I think we have to use our position of power and privilege to say it how it is. So we do need to do things like understand why it is that policymakers demand certain kinds of information rather than just giving them what they think they need or you know what they say they need and what they think they need. And I realise that that's very difficult when there's some money on the line and your department's telling you to go get that money. Um, I also think that this is not just about hanging on to that you know, that little contact that you got from the policymaker, and I don't want to share that because that's my policy lead. Um, you need to form alliances and you need to form not just personal relationships, but alliances across sectors, across disciplines, within the global south. I'm so sick of hearing about this from a global north perspective. Um, in order to create the change that we believe in. If you want change, we need to create it. It is not going to happen from the top. So we need to create the change that we want to see happen. That means doing our research in a certain way, engaging in processes of co-creation, co co-production. I know there are lots of challenges around that. I know it's also contested and sometimes not really co-production or co-creation. Um, but my experience of that work is always that it challenges my assumptions. And I am a researcher in the global north tradition. And I am white. And I am all those things that make me have a very particular perspective. And I think having our own perspectives challenged is critically important. We need to develop participatory approaches, again, not for their own sake, because at the end of the day, when none of this makes a difference to the policy, we have communities that have capacity, that have resilience, that have the ability to mobilize themselves in the face of adversity. We've given them something. We haven't changed the world. We always say to them, we're going to do some policy research, but we can't guarantee it will change the policy. No, it won't, chances are. But you can change your ability to understand, make sense of, and articulate your own situation. And some of the best projects I've ever been involved in, like, for example, on destitution, have, again, had no impact on destitution. But there are four or five people of the 17... Um, destitute asylum seekers that we worked with and trained in this particular methodology that have gone on to do wonderful things 
in organizations in the global north and the global south. And I think that makes that work worthwhile, even if it hasn't changed the policy. So two points to leave you on, and they're the tough ones, but they're really important. If you want to make a difference, challenge the assumptions of policymakers and funders, even if this undermines your own privilege. I know it's tough, and I'm in a very privileged position because I have a full-time permanent job. For now, at least, we have Brexit. Let's see. Um, but, you know, I'm in a, I can stand here and say this to you. I don't fear the consequences. Lots of people do, and I get that. But all of us are still more privileged in the production of knowledge than most other people. So we cannot and should not forget that. And finally, stick with it. It's tough. You may think like it's a complete waste of time. There are various expressions for that, and I sometimes use them, but they're quite rude. Um, you probably imagine you're not making a difference. I often imagine I'm not making a difference. But you probably are in ways that you can't even imagine. Because the whole point about change is that it happens in the least expected ways. And sometimes, like, you know, somebody will walk up to me and say, oh, you gave this lecture 10 years ago in some country, kind of remember and I then went and did X. And you do not know, when you're doing those things, what those ripple effects will be of your work. So believe me when I say, don't look for the shiny media article. In fact, hide away from the shiny media article at the moment. It's usually not a good sign. Um, but do believe that because you're doing is, what you're doing is right, and it has integrity, and you want to make a difference, it is doing that, just in ways that you can't yet imagine or understand. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heaven. That was, that was exceptional and uh, very challenging. And I think the, the last point that you made about stick with itness, uh, something that really struck me in the presentation, is the tenacity that you've shown. And I think it's, it's a very direct challenge to all of us that, that this is not an easy path, but by playing the long game, that there's a hope not only individually, but collectively, that there is a potential for change. But we can't expect that to be an easy course. And I think that, especially not now. You know, especially not now. And the way that you laid it out for us and was were so honest and candid with your own experience and your own journey, I think provides an exceptionally challenging but empowering uh, model uh, for all of us to reflect upon. Um, I also want to note that there's a very interesting conversation between your presentation and A, what Osama had to say yesterday about from the perspective of the Network for Refugee Voices in understanding uh, the policy cycle and where there are moments for um, impact or influence. And so the, this is the kind of dialogue that we were hoping to be able to set up, and sort of where are those moments and what are those alliances that can be formed not only across research communities and disciplines and geographies, but from the research community with uh, refugee-led organizations, with practitioners. So this idea of how coalitions evolve and grow and build momentum, I think, is quite important. But also to flag tomorrow morning's keynote uh, by Professor Koti Kamanga, we'll look exactly at this question of the political economy of knowledge production and these north-south dynamics of producing knowledge and the co-creation of knowledge. So you have done done an exceptional job, but I'm sure that there are questions and commentaries from the audience if we can take advantage of the time that we have now. So first uh, to Mustafa. Thank you so much. It was great. Um, I have a quick, three questions. <laughs> quick <Okay>. three. <laughs> Um, so part of our recommendation from Network for Refugee Voices on draft two, uh, or even Global Compact on Refugees, was actually data and evidence in a way that we still think in terms of data collection is not really very efficient, and especially in terms of um, economic uh, perspective, in terms of like collecting data on uh, education, experience, and all of that. So I want to know uh, some of your thoughts on this, please. Um, there's also um, a little bit kind of um, a talk or direction in terms of uh, global compact on refugees and global compact on migration need to collaborate for them to be better. I also would hope to know your thoughts on this. Um, the last one on terms of you talked a lot about the relationship between uh, researchers and, and policy, uh, policy makers. Um, 
I always have a theory in a way also there is, I think there, in my own personal opinion, there is a disconnection between researchers and public in a way, like how to read the research, how to deliver it in the best way for them. Do you think and actually if, we're, if, if there is a way to reach out to public easier and influence their opinion that will lead to a policymaker change um, in a way? Yeah, thank you. Do you want to take a few questions and I'll, sure. sometimes it's easier because they sort of relate to one another. And if I could ask everyone just to introduce themselves as you ask your question, please. Hi, my name is Shana Platt. I'm from the University of Winnipeg, and I'm also with the Global Reporting Center. Um, and I, I want to thank you very much for, for your talk. Um, I was surprised, actually, you didn't use the, the language of framing. I, I just I, I kept filling in with, with framing in that sense. Um, you, you spoke a lot about media. Um, and obviously, we know the things that can be criticized in terms of media. Um, but going to Mustafa's last point, what role can media play as a means of being able to make knowledge accessible to those who are often uh, removed or uh, obstructed from policy banking uh, processes? Also, how do we open up then the space of politics beyond that of formal policy through the use of media? I'm specifically interested, not in anthropomorphizing media as this evil entity, but actually opening up who gets to make this media as well. Yeah, thank you. Sure. <clears throat> I'm Osama Salem, Network for Refugee Voices. Thank you, Heaven. You made me want to go back to research again, actually. Um, <laughs> I thought I'd put everybody off. <laughs> <laughs> um, what uh, what I would like to ask is, uh, I know that the, also it builds builds up on what Mustafa um, asked. When there is uh, um, a production of an academic paper or a research, how do you guarantee in academia to that this would be not readable by public but actually by policymakers? I mean, in the end, it's a selective information that policymakers do. They would read what they want to read, and they will ignore what they want to ignore. And I would like to know how academia would guarantee that this information would actually reach out to the right people. Thank you. OK. I'll deal with that question first, I think, um, because it speaks very much to, I suppose, the presentation in a way. Um, OK, let's unpack this term policymaker. Because when people say that, I, and I'm, I use it myself, we use it as shorthand, it's really not clear what we mean. Do we mean the local, local authority policymaker, the national government policymaker, the person in the UNHCR? So straight away we've got different levels in terms of scale, but we've also got um, different parts of policy. So, for example, when I worked in the Home Office, I worked in a separate bit that was research. That research bit is now incorporated into the Immigration Department, if you like. So it was something and now it's different. But within the Immigration Department, you have the research team, very small, but then you have people who are responsible for resettlement policy, for running the detention estate, for you know, immigration control more generally, for visas. So there's a whole range of different policy audiences. And there's also policy audiences that are not in policy themselves, like NGOs and civil society organizations. So the question of how do we get policymakers to read our research depends on who the policymaker is, and frankly, whether or not they're interested in research. So 90%, I think it's a guess, but of people who work in government are not interested in research. Research is not their job. It's not their interest. They are about delivery. So they are told what to do by the policy leads for those issues. So what matters is the policy lead. And that policy lead is basically told what to do by the person in power. So they don't just going off and thinking, oh, we could do X or we could do Y. They're told by the person in power what to look at. So, you know, in this case, David Blunkett, the Home Secretary, will come to me via um, his special advisor and say, you know, the Daily Mail is really concerned about X, and they were doing that even then. Um, we need to think about why, go and do some research on. At that point, as a researcher, I might go, okay, Google, Google, what research has been done on X? 
So that's the kind of process. So you need to make sure that your work is Googleable <laughs> because that's where people get the information. But you also need to bear in mind that you can waste a lot of effort and a lot of time going for the 100% when actually there's only a small number of people that even have that role. You know, they're not, nobody else is even interested. So that's where all those little tips and hints come on, you know, making it accessible, doing a policy brief, going through a knowledge broker, blah de blah de blah But, you know, in the end, the synthesis part comes down to a very few number of individuals. And if you can find out who those individuals are, and I was one of them, you make your alliances with them, because everybody else is a waste of time. So finding out who your alliances should be is the number one. Um, but frankly, the other thing with academic papers is other academics don't read them. So um, open access will help on that, for sure. Uh, but also, there's too many papers out there. I mean, I'm sorry. They're all very interesting, but. So I don't publish academic articles generally. I've only published three in my life. Um, I've got two more coming, but that's because there's a ref exercise. Um, but generally, I think that if we want to make a change, then other audiences require other kinds of outputs. Normally, whatever you write as an academic paper, you can convert in some way into a conversation piece, into a, you know, it can be converted into other formats easily. You've already done the work. So whatever you write, try and go for as many formats as possible, but don't just do it to say, I've done X, Y, Z formats, tick them off. Think about who you want to read that and then send it to them. Do you know what I mean? Which kind of in a way ties to your point about the media. Um, because I think the other, issue when we come to the media is how can we communicate information to the media? Well, you know, there's half a dozen newspapers around the world that are interested, and there's a whole bunch of other online, non-conventional um, information sources that people are increasingly turning to. I've done lots of work around public attitude formation in the media, and I feel like I kind of know the deal. But I have to say the media is increasingly becoming a less important part of the framing, by which I mean the conventional newspaper media. Albeit, you know, the Daily Mail is the most widely read newspaper in the whole of the global north, because in North America they have a great online version oriented towards your audience. I know that because I can't get away from Trump. It's royal wedding if I go on the UK version and Trump on the US Canadian version. Um, but you know, they have, they have violence, death, awful migration stories in the left-hand column, sex and celebrity in the right-hand column. They draw people in, in various ways. You're never gonna change the Daily Mail, okay? I'm, I've given up trying. I've had several columns written about me, including one in the sun. It's, it's, we're not the, they're not the audience for us and we're not the audience for them. You've gotta know who your audience is. I'm, I know I've said this before, but I think it's very important to remember that when we look at attitudes to immigration, we've got kind of 20% either end of the spectrum who are either on our side or absolutely unmovable. Don't bother with them. Go for the 60% in the middle, the, un, you know, the, the uneasy, anxious middle, whatever we want to call them, who are somewhere along a spectrum. Now, the problem is they're not all like, oh, I really want some information about migration policy. They're not all frantically going online trying to find a document that tells them about the complex nuances of the visa regime system. Not really what they're interested in. What they're interested in is the, the context, the framing, if you like, but the overall environment and what it means for them. Because most of them, you know, it doesn't affect them directly. It increasingly will, actually. But um, So the issue is how do we change the framing? Um, again, using that language. And for me, at this point of where I am in my life, and I realize that other people are in different places, top-down politics is a waste of time. I'm not even gonna waste, I'm not even gonna spend my time doing it anymore. I've done that, wasted what I feel is endless conversations on you know, platforms with the Balkan summit with the deputy foreign minister of Macedonia, who two days later closed the border. You know, I've done it. We've all done it who've been in this world long enough uh, doing this research. Build your alliances from the ground up. Build up civil society organizations. We've just done a piece of work with Ben and Jerry, and no, I wasn't paid with ice cream, um, the usual remark. Um, there is loads of stuff going on, loads of stuff. It's not being amplified because the media doesn't want that story in the narrative. Politicians don't want that story in the narrative. But if you go to any community anywhere in the world, this stuff is happening. And it's our job, I think, to amplify it because those people in power don't want to. So finding ways of amplifying those stories, because in the end, 
the public lives in communities with people. And although they read newspapers and they hear all this stuff, their personal lived experiences of it will act as a counter. And if we can strengthen their capacity, their resilience to that, then I think that's what will make the difference. GCRM, GCRF. Oh. Yeah. Um, I, I, I suppose it just comes back to my early points. More and more data is not the issue. If the data was telling governments what they wanted to hear, that data would be sufficient, but it's not. And so we keep on keeping on until we get the right answers. So I'm not for one minute saying there shouldn't be data and you know, it's important that it's referenced, but the problem with both of those, convent with those compacts, in my view, is A, that they're separate, and B, that they're separate reflects the politics of all of this, um, which is nobody is prepared to tackle head on the long-term vision of what a world with more migration looks like. They're just not. Um, and that, of course, relies on political leaders who are aiming for a five or whatever it is term. So, it, in a way, I, you know, I have engaged with the process, I am engaging with the process, but I'm much more interested in engaging with the grassroots because that will stay there when all of this global compact nonsense is over, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> And, and, and I, I think that last point is a very healthy reminder, going back to the idea of playing the long game, is that there's this impulse to respond to sort of the latest policy initiative. Some of us the remember the last well, round in the early 2000s well, the, and the, the, contributed with that too. The agenda for protection and yeah, the yeah, global yeah. consultations. It's going to change everything. That's right. And so, but playing the long game and having that persistence, I think. And I was also struck, uh, reminded, um, uh, Gregory Maniatis, who many of you know with the Open Society Foundation, uses the analogy in terms of, are you looking to influence the, you know, the 50 key decision makers at the top, the 500 individuals involved in bureaucratic policy making decisions, the 5,000 individuals who are involved in this in a day-to-day -day way, the 50,000 informed and, and, and sympathetic readers, and sort of the layers of the onion keep going. But mindful that since 2015, there's been this uptick in interest with private sector, with, with different community groups that are keen to do something, but are they're sort of like a heat-seeking mm. missile. Those yeah. are looking for some direction in which to take. So there the is- The heat keeps moving. Well, it does. <laughs> and, and so there's the sense of, on the one hand, to try and set the agenda, but also to be dynamic enough to respond to opportunities as they come up. Yeah, and I, just to respond to that, I do, I mean, I have been reflecting upon this quite a bit, in part because I'm 77, so it's a time in my life when I, I should be. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to see what Google uh, Guess Your Age says about me at the end of this conference. So. I, I know that everybody's going to be Googling how old are you with a series of photos afterwards in the coffee break. Um, no, I mean, I, one, of those, one of the things that I've come to realise is, especially when we look at that link between, you know, the money, the funder and everything else, is that chasing the money actually is also a long game. And that the most interesting research is almost 10 years ahead of its time. And we can feel very out of step because we feel like, oh, this is the issue. Let's go and work on this issue. By the time we've written about this issue, this issue is not the issue anymore. Um, with some exceptions, I mean, resettlements stay the test of time, but it's one of the few. People who were writing on Windrush 10 years ago probably felt that their time would never come. And suddenly they're like, yes, my time has come. But nobody wants there to be a crisis to th then pivot your information into the domain. So I think that what a lot of us are doing, which is about complexity, it is about you know, the way the world is going and will go, in 20, 20 years time, um, it's going to be very on the money. <laughs> now that's not what you want to hear when you're here now and you've got kids to feed and all the rest of it. And I do feel like um, I may end up having this kind of thing on my grave if there is such a thing when you're buried these days um, where 20 years ago I remember saying to people don't worry in 20 years time we'll look back and wonder what all the fuss was about on migration and now I'm like okay so it's got to get worse before it gets better but at some point just by virtue of the demographics of nothing else this has to change and I don't know how I personally think this is all the migration thing is all situated within a broader capitalist crisis because I am Sussex University born and bred Marxist. Um, so I think capitalism is eating its tail essentially and what we're seeing not just on refugees but on a whole myriad of other issues from environment to politics to whatever is a symptom of that. I think the scary thing is that none of us know what comes next 
But I think whatever we're doing now is probably setting us in better stead for that than the things that people think we should be doing now in terms of the research. Because the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. Like as in, in 20 years time, it won't look like it did 20 years ago. So I really believe that you stick by what you believe in and do good research. And, you know, the time will come, hopefully. Hopefully, I think we all hope that. Well, let's, let's end this session on, on, the, uh, on the note of hope and optimism. Uh, Heaven, that was, that was extraordinary and uh, a, very, uh, a very challenging, a very compelling, uh, but a very motivating talk, which I think really uh, enhances, uh, gives us real focus for the next uh, two and a half, three days in terms of the kinds of conversations that we hope to be able to have but really gave us a framework within which we can also, we can challenge ourselves individually and I think collectively as a community in terms of the conversations that we need to be having and the perspective that we take in what constitutes change and how long it takes to realize lasting change. So, oh. it is my profound <laughs> pleasure to present you with Thank a little token of our much. gift. If you, could, if you could please join me in thanking Heather. Right. And so, we are off and running, and so we now have uh, a, a coffee break uh, for half an hour. Uh, as Nemo said in her introductory comments, it's a beautiful day. Uh, we are uh, on, the, uh, on the shores of the Rideau River by the rapids, so during the coffee break or during the lunch break, I do encourage you to uh, get outside to, uh, to, to photosynthesize. Uh, as you head out of the building, if you turn right and you go past the statue of Mahatma Gandhi, you will see some uh, picnic benches and some space for you to get some fresh air. Uh, a few points on logistics. Uh, first of all, anyone who has kindly agreed to be a chair for a session or who has been voluntold to be a chair uh, for a session uh, in our next few days, please be sure to get a, a handy dandy handout from the registration table just so that there's some consistency across uh, panels in terms of how we chair and moderate and share time. I would also like to say with great pride that we have the, the little handy dandy five minute remaining, two minutes remaining, so that we're able to remind our speakers uh, that no more than 50% of the uh, panel time uh, should be taken by presentations to allow uh, maximum time uh, for discussion in the panels. So after the coffee break at 11 o'clock, we will begin the, uh, the, the concurrent panels. Uh, there's a round table uh, in this room. There are then sessions in two uh, breakout rooms on the second floor adjacent to the copy breaks. If you're looking for a room that starts with a three, that's on the third floor. So the main staircase from the atrium, you go upstairs and you will find the three breakout rooms that start with the 3,000 numbers there. Anyone with a, uh, a pink colored name tag will be able to help direct you. So uh, once again, Heaven, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy your coffee break. We'll re reconvene in the breakout rooms uh, at 11 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>